ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله تركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك ولا ينتظم في سلكها إلا سالك اللهم صل وسلم وأنعم وأكرم وبارك على حبيبنا وشفيعنا وملاذنا وقرة عيوننا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الأولين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الآخرين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين يقول عز من قائل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون اللهم اجعلنا منهم يا رب العالمين اللهم آمين In the name of Allah the gracious the merciful to him we belong and to him we shall return we ask Allah جل وعلا in his infinite grace and boundless mercy to send an abundance of prayers and peace upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us in these blessed days of the hijjah We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon this ummah in these blessed days of the hijjah We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate the ranks of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in these blessed days of the hijjah ya rabbal alameen. Brothers and sisters, Allah Jalla wa Ala in Surah Al Hajj calls upon Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam and gives him a very direct and explicit command where he says, Wa'adhim fin nasi bil hajji ya tu karijalan, wa ala kuli damiri ya tina min kuli fajin amik, liashadu manafi alahum. وَيَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْلُومَاتٍ Allah Jalla wa Ala calls upon Sayyidina Ibrahim and commands him to do a very specific thing where he says أَذِّمْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ Call Ya Ibrahim, the people, towards the sacred ritual of Hajj, the pilgrimage, the sacred pilgrimage to the lands of Mecca. And this adhan, when we hear this word, we're familiar with the adhan being the call to prayer. But here, this is the adhan, the magnificent adhan of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which was made over 4,000 years ago, where he called all people till the end of time to the house, the sacred house, to the house of Allah jalla wa ala in, al in Mecca al-Mukarramah. And this is the very essential call that is the essence of surrender to Allah Jalla wa Ala. That the entire life of the believer is responding to the call of Allah and His messengers and His prophets to surrender and to submit. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَأَذِّن فِي النَّاسِ وَأَذِّن فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ Call the people towards Hajj and they will come to you whether walking, رِجَالًا أو على كل ضامر or upon any ضامر and ضامر brothers and sisters is the weakest form of a beast of burden a weakest animal that can be ridden what Allah Jalla wa Ala is saying is that throughout for the rest of time, people will come in all forms of transportation, whether on foot, on camelback, on horseback, on mule, in planes, in boats, cars, trains, people will come and they will flurry to the sacred house. Yet they come from every fajin amiq, from every vast crevice in the earth. Every corner, every pathway, every aisleway, people will come, no matter how close or how far, for two things. لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ وَيَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْلُومَاتٍ 
so that they can be exposed and be witness and receive so many benefits and blessings for themselves and that they remember Allah Jalla wa Ala in those numbered and apportioned days. Brothers and sisters, this call of Ibrahim alayhi salam was responded to by millions upon millions and millions of people throughout time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself responded to the call of Sayyidina Ibrahim. We're on the fifth of Dhul Qa'dah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the tenth year of Hijrah, he called upon his Ummah and he said, Today we will make the sacred pilgrimage of Hajj. Accompanied with him from Medina was over 100,000 companions as they journeyed towards Mecca al Mukarramah to fulfill the call that was called by Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was journeying through the lands from Medina towards Mecca, he would stop and he would pause in moments and he would say, here in this valley, in this region, كَأَنِّي أَرَى مُوسَى وَهُوَ يَعُجُّ بِالتَّلْبِيَةِ It is as if I see Musa when he happened upon Wadi Al-Azraq a valley, a valley known as Al-Azraq. He said, I see Musa. Ka'anni ara Musa. It is as if I see Musa standing here. Ya'ujju bit-talbiya. And Ya'ujju means that he was calling out. That his heart, his soul, and his body was reverberating the talbiya. Labbayka Allahumma labbayk. Labbayka la sharika laka labbayk. Inna alhamda wa na'mata laka wal mulk. La sharika lak. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that Musa alayhi salam was standing here with his people making the talbiyah. And he would walk a little bit further and he would pass upon another valley or mountain. He would say Yunus alayhi salam came here with his people and he made the talbiyah. And today here we are. The Prophet is saying with you my companions and we are making the same exact talbiyah. لبيك اللهم لبيك. And these words, brothers and sisters, the words of the talbiyah are beautifully sacred and profound words because they speak to the very essence of what it means to be a Muslim, someone who surrenders themselves to Allah. When the believer says لبيك, they are saying, Ya Allah, I hear the call and I am at your service. لبيك means I am at your service, Ya Allah. You created me. You sustain me. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You call me. And I say, I surrender. And I am at your service, Ya Allah. Labbayka la sharika laka labbayk. I am at your service, Ya Allah. And I know there is no one who is a partner with you. There was no one who is associated with you even remotely. The purity of tawheed, the oneness of Allah Jalla wa Ala. Inna alhamda wal ni'mata laka wal mulk. That verily, Ya Allah, all hamd, all praise, and all blessings belong to you and are from you. Laka wal mulk. They belong to you and all dominion is yours. You are owner of all things. You have ownership over this entire creation. La sharika laka labbi. There are no partners to you, and Ya Allah, we are at your service. Brothers and sisters, when we review these words and think about them, we realize that this is our entire theology. Our entire belief system is rendered down to these, as this, this meaning of surrender to Allah, of responding to Allah's call, and saying, Ya Allah, I am at your service. I remove my ego. I have no ego in front of you, Ya Allah. I have no opinion in front of you, Ya Allah. You tell me what to do, Ya Allah, and that is essentially and precisely what I will commit myself to doing. Because I know that my only virtuous existence on this earth lies in my commitment to you. Allah, God, the creator of all things. And that is the call, brothers and sisters, that today millions of people from across the world are preparing themselves for. There are already many who have gone. And in the coming days, many will go. 
And on the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah, millions of people, around four million people, will be present in the sacred lands making Hajj. And if it wasn't for the quota of four million just to regulate the traffic, you know that it would be millions upon millions, at least 10 to 20 millions, if not more, who would be there making the Hajj. A sacred and truly miraculous pilgrimage. Brothers and sisters, that all of us, our hearts must be attached to. All of us, whether we are going or not, we should long for that sacred space. Allah Jalla wa ala in Surah Al Hajj says, Thalika wa may you avim sha'a ir Allah, fa inaha min taqwal kulub. That verily those who glorify the sacred rituals of Allah Jalla wa ala, that is the very essence of what it means to have taqwa in the heart, to have God consciousness in this soul. To have God consciousness is what the entire journey of the believer is to be mindful of Allah and so when Hajj comes we don't just say oh well that's not something I have the capacity to do so I don't care no I have to long for the Hajj I have to yearn for the Hajj the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he yearned to be around the Kaaba he was kicked out of Mecca and he lived all of those years yearning for the sacred house and when Allah Jalla wa Ala purified Mecca al mukarrama and he purified the Kaaba, he called upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Now you come. Wa taqsid bayt Allah al haram. Because Hajj linguistically means al qasd, to desire, to pursue, to go after. And spiritually, what Hajj is, is qasd bayt Allah al haram, is that we seek out. And we yearn for Baytullah al Haram. Because when Allah Jalla wa Ala commanded Ibrahim alayhi salam to take Hajar and Ismail and go to Mecca al Mukarrama, he did that by telling him basically, leave everything behind and take your wife and your son and go to that space. Because this is the journey of a lifetime. We use that word very often when talking about going on a major vacation, hiking through the Andes, or visiting the Great Wall in China, or going to these different spaces, or visiting the pyramids. It was a journey of a lifetime. Brothers and sisters, the only true journey of a lifetime is to take the journey of Ibrahim alayhi salam, of Musa alayhi salam, of Yunus alayhi salam, of all of the prophets, and finally our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, because that journey, this journey of Hajj, is the journey that they all yearn for. When you look at Ibrahim's journey to Hajj, when you look at his journey to Mecca, because everything about Hajj for us is following in the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi salam and his wife Hajar and his son Ismail. The entire Hajj is manifested in the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And when we analyze his life, we see that everything about his life was surrender. That when he surrendered to Allah in a young age, to call to the oneness of Allah jalla wa ala, it led to him being thrust and thrown into the fire. But Ibrahim alayhi salam did not hesitate for a moment to surrender to Allah jalla wa ala. He didn't know that when he was going to be thrown into the fire, that Allah would command that fire to be bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. He didn't know that that fire would be cool and peaceful upon him. All he knew that his duty was to surrender to Allah, and that's precisely what he did. When he was commanded by Allah to take Hajar and to take Ismail to go to those lands, biwadin ghayri dhi zar'in inda baytika al muharram, in a valley that had no vegetation. No water, no sewer system, no wall, no buildings, no malls, no hotels, none of what we see today. May Allah purify our lands. None of what you see today. Barren, completely barren. He did not hesitate. He surrendered to the command of Allah Jalla wa Ala. He did not know, brothers and sisters, that when he would go there and he would leave his wife and his son there, he had no idea that Zamzam was going to break. And when Hajar surrendered herself 
by asking Ibrahim, did Allah, Allah, did Allah command you to leave us here? She herself did not know what was to come. But they both knew that the essential purpose of their existence was to surrender to the command and the will of Allah. And so they did it lovingly. They surrendered beautifully. And Allah Jalla wa ala, after Hajar moving back and forth between as Safa wal Marwa, which is precisely what we do when we go to Hajj and Umrah, Allah Jalla wa ala gifted her with this beautiful and miraculous wellspring known as Zamzam that nourishes the bodies of millions of Muslims until today. An unparalleled wellspring in human creation, the well of Zamzam. When Ibrahim alayhi salam, brothers and sisters, was commanded to slaughter his son Ismail, he had no idea that Ismail would be replaced with Dibhin Azim, with a sheep to or a goat to slaughter. He did not know that. All he knew was Allah commanded him to slaughter the sheep. Did he hesitate? No. Falamma aslama watallahu lil jabeen. And later on, فَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ Allah Jalla wa ala tells us about the essence of Ibrahim فلم, and his son Ismail when they both aslama, when they both surrendered. And Ibrahim put down the son, his son's head to be slaughtered and he was removing his knife to slaughter his son's neck. It wasn't a metaphor, it was real. Allah Jalla wa ala says we stopped him and we replaced him with dhibhin azim, with a slaughter, with a beautiful, magnificent slaughter. And until today, brothers and sisters, whether you are making hajj, and in hajj you, we make udhiya, we make hadj, and or you're staying locally, you make udhiya, or commonly called qurbani. It is all emblematic of the surrender of Ibrahim and his son Ismail to fulfill the command of Allah Jalla wa ala. Brothers and sisters, why am I elaborating so much on the story of Ibrahim? Because when we turn our hearts to Hajj, which, is our, which are a succession of rituals that don't necessarily have any clear, logical, scientific wisdom behind them, we start with the Kaaba and we, remove, we move around the Kaaba seven times and we touch the black stone which is called Yameenullahi fil ard, the right hand of Allah Jalla wa ala on this earth, and we renew our covenant with Allah Jalla wa ala by touching the black stone. And we go back and forth between as Safa wal Marwa, and then we spend a day, the Yawmu Tarwiya, the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah, on the plains of Mina, awaiting the sacred and blessing and miraculous day of Arafah, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Al Hajju Arafah. And we stand and we know that on that day, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ghufran is, is remarkable. That there is no day when necks are saved from Jahannam, like the day of Arafah. When Allah Jalla wa ala boasts about us to his angels. And he says, Unzuru ila ibadi, look at my servants. They came to me, Shu'ath and Ghubra. They, they came to me in this state of Sha'ath and Ghabar or Ghubar. They came to me in this disheveled, dusty state, responding to my call. And so today, what I give to them is all that they desire. Al Hujjaj wal Umar, Wafdullah. That the one who makes Hajj and the one who makes Umrah is from the honored guests of Allah. فَأَجَابُونِي I call them and they respond to my call. فَسَأَلُونِي فَأَعْطَيْتُهُمْ So they then ask me and I give them. SubhanAllah brothers and sisters, if we can just appreciate the meanings of those words when Allah Jalla wa ala is telling us that you res I called upon you and you responded. I called you to make hajj. I called you to pray five times a day. I called you to pray zakah, to pay zakah. I called you to stay away from a few things, a few muharramat. I asked you to do a number of things. I called you and you responded. And so you ask of me and I give you, Allah says.
لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير Brothers and sisters, our hearts, our minds, our souls must be turned towards the sacred rituals of Allah. When the Ibrahim alayhi salam was making dua, when he was asked by Allah to build the Kaaba, when Allah commanded Ibrahim to build the Kaaba, Ibrahim sat down, Sayyidina Ibrahim sat down and he made dua. And from the dua that he made is something truly profound. He says, فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِّنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي When he asked for the people to now come. He didn't just say, Ya Allah, I want bodies to come. He didn't just say, I want inanimate objects to come. He said, what I desire are afidatun minan nas, afidatan minan nas. I desire that it is hearts that come to me, that come to the sacred house. To say that everything about these sacred rituals is our hearts being directed towards Allah Jalla wa'ala. And that's why we make tawaf with our left sides and not our right side. Because the heart is towards the left side of the chest. And so we are putting our hearts in the direction of the Kaaba to say, Ya Allah, our hearts simply reverberate around you, turn towards you. Allahu Jalla wa'ala. And after the day of Arafah, the day of forgiveness, the day of Itqum Minan Ninar, Niran, millions of people will stay in Al Mash'al Al Haram, in Muzdalifa, spending time in that night. And for those who've made Hajj, as I've learned from them, there are no provisions, there are no, no tents, there's nothing in Muzdalifa. It's you in the open sky. It is so emblematic of the day of judgment. Everything about Arafah, everything about Muzdalifa is about the Day of Judgment. And when you think about it, you think about the fact that you're leaving behind everything. You're leaving your provisions, your clothing, you're leaving your family, your loved ones, what you're familiar with. You're divorcing the entirety of the world to go towards that journey, that sacred journey to say to Allah, Ya Allah, I only care about you. Today I rid myself of all provisions to stand naked in front of you as we will come to stand naked in front of Allah Jalla wa ala on the day of judgment. That is a reality, that is the truth and Hajj is to remind us of that moment. When people are, are sleeping, standing, sweating, tired, sick, feet hurting, hot, bothered, winds, storms, it doesn't matter. You are committing yourself to Allah Jalla wa ala. Brothers and sisters, this is our life. When we think about Hajj, we have to think about the journey of life. That this journey of life is not about these material things that we covet or the comfort that we so yearn for. But it's about this journey of submission that regardless of what happens in this dunya, regardless of whether we get married, we have kids, we have money, we have health, those things are all tertiary. They're all secondary. But as long as I can meet Allah saying, Ya Allah, I come to you in full submission, then I have received victory in this dunya. That as long as I can make the dua of Sayyidina Yusuf, Tawaffani Musliman wa alhiqni bis salihin. Ya Allah, all I desire, after you put me through all of these different challenges in the dunya, all I care about is that you allow to die me, you allow me to die as a Muslim, and you allow me to be with the righteous in the afterlife. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he speaks to us about Hajj. He tells us, he gives us guidance and language that should make us, that should compel us and drive every orifice of our body to yearn to be there, to strive to make it my life's mission to go towards Hajj. The Prophet ﷺ says, There is no reward for the Hajj that is mabrur illa al Jannah. That the only reward for a righteous pilgrimage is Jannah. That when you make Hajj and you make a Hajj that is mabrur according to the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, 
then you, you are guaranteed Jannah. May Allah grant us that. Man hajja wa lam yarfuth, falam yarfuth wa lam yafsuq. That those who make hajj and they do not make any fisq or any type of rafath, then they will come back. Raja'a ka yawmi waladathu ummu. Then they will come back just as their mothers gave birth to them. That those who make hajj and they do not engage in any illicit behaviors and they do not make any fisk or fujur, any type of sinful behaviors, then they will return from that journey just like the day their mother gave birth to them. Brothers and sisters, so many of us, we are carrying so many burdens of sin, pain that we're living in because of infractions that we've committed, zina that we've committed, illicit relations with others that we've committed, haram money that we've taken, that we should never have taken, abuses that we have incurred upon others, all sorts of sinful behavior, prayers that we have neglected, fajr that, that we do not pay attention to, many, many salawat that we've neglected, zakah that we have not paid, ramadans that we have not fasted, Allah Jalla wa ala is always giving us opportunities to have our entire slate cleansed and cleaned. And one of the most miraculous moments for that cleansing is Al Hajjul Mabrur. May Allah grant every single one of us Hajjul Mabrur. But, brothers and sisters, something that is so beautiful about Hajj that the Prophet alayhi, that Allah tells us explicitly in the Quran this is the only obligation that Allah uses the word istita'ah in the Qur'an. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ أو حَجُّ الْبَيْتِ according to the narrations or the recitations لِمَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا For those who have the capacity to make hajj. Because Allah knows that this is a challenging journey to go on. He knows that many sacrifices have to be made and He knows all too well that there are many people who are impoverished, who are Muslim, who cannot make this journey. But when you see that Allah speaks about istita'a, capacity to make hajj, and if you don't have that capacity, then you don't have to make it. You know you're dealing with Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. That He gives us opportunities, that for those of us who can make that journey, we should. We should strive to make it. In the time of Muhammad ibn Sirin, he was standing, he was sitting during the Hajj, and he was amongst the Tabi'een. He was sitting in the Kaaba, next to the Kaaba, and a man came to him and said, Oh brother, where have you made your Hajj from? Where do you come from? Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Sirin said to him, Oh subhanallah, I come from far away lands. It has taken me months to come here. I come from Iraq. And so the man smiled and he said, Bal anta jarun li baytillah. Rather, he smiled and he said, You are a neighbor to the house of Allah. I come to you min biladi ma wara an nahr. I come to you from the lands of Trans Oxania, modern day Central Asia, where you have Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. He's like, I come to you from those lands, and it has taken me over two years to make it here. Over two years, it took him to come from Biladi Ma Wara An Nahr, from Trans Oxania, to make it towards the Kaaba. Why do you think it took him two years, brothers and sisters? Because the journey of Hajj for many is not something that just requires them taking some money out of their ATM or saving a few paychecks and then jumping on a Hajj package on a plane towards Jeddah. But for them, it was a lifelong journey that would be done in the form of going out with whatever basic provisions they had. And when those provisions ran out, they would stop and they would work for a week and for months until they could gain more provisions to continue the journey until they made it to, the Mecca, to Mecca, to the sacred house. That is sacrifice, brothers and sisters. All of us have to commit ourselves to that sacrifice. There are brothers and sisters in the world today 
when I was in Al Azhar and I had so many classmates from Africa and they would tell me from Uganda, from Senegal, from West Africa, from South Africa, all across, they would tell me about their villages and how the entire village would save all of its wealth to just send out one of the village elders to Hajj. Just one. And he would be known as Al Hajj, the one who went and made Hajj. He would go and he would carry the obligation of the entire village on his shoulders to fulfill it on behalf of his people. Subhanallah. That is a journey of sacrifice. Today, brothers and sisters, I know many do not have the capacity to make Hajj, but that never means that you should not have the distinct intentionality that you will make Hajj. You implore Allah Jalla wa ala. You say, Ya Allah, I will make Hajj. Urzukni Hajja. Grant me a Hajj. Say it from your heart. Say it from your soul. Let your entire body shake that you will make Hajj. And if you're someone who has the capacity to make Hajj, but has been lazy or neglectful, brothers and sisters, I warn you. Because the Prophet wasallam has said very, very difficult things about the person who has the capacity to make Hajj and does not make Hajj. Basically, and I will not repeat it now because of how jarring it is, but he says that basically you should worry about your state when you die. That you should not be confident that if you die, having had the capacity to make Hajj and not made Hajj, your afterlife is definitely not guaranteed. Brothers and sisters, we have to be mindful that this is a journey that should be, we should deeply be concerned about fulfilling. That we will save paychecks, that we will cut back. We will not build this expansion or buy this car or buy this thing. That we will move in the direction of saving whatever resources we have to come to that amount of money that is required to make Hajj so that Allah Jalla wa Ala can grant us the Endling, endless bounties and beauties of Hajj. And lastly, brothers and sisters, when we experience Hajj, when you look at the faces of the people who go to Hajj from every corner of this earth, it is the most miraculous sight to see that every color, every shade, every financial status, wealthy and poor, everyone is making Hajj that you may never have the opportunity to visit Nepal or to visit Mauritius or to visit Uganda, to visit Australia. You may never have those opportunities, but Allah Jalla wa Ala will bring in this profoundly beautiful gravitational force all of the hearts of the believers and centralize them in that one location where you will stand side by side by your brother and sister from Nepal or from Burma or from Africa or from Asia or from Arabia, wherever they may be, and you will all collectively say Allahu Akbar. Because when you just simply even watch the videos of the Hujjaj and the Umar being in the Kaaba, millions of people, when the Imam says Allahu Akbar, every single thing stops. And everyone raises their hand, throwing everything behind them and saying, Allahu Akbar. And you look and it's utter silence. You can watch this on YouTube. Go and just watch how you see millions of people bustling around. The Imam says, Allahu Akbar, and everyone stops. That is only indicative of one thing. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. May Allah make our Iman and our Islam and our Ihsan beautifully fortified in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, in closing, for those who are not going to Hajj, for those who will be remaining here, don't ever forget that you are in the sacred and blessed days of Dhul Hijjah. And that in these days of Dhul Hijjah, if your intention is pure, and you have the presence of mind that so many of the bounties that the Hujjaj will receive, you can receive by being here. And especially the day of Arafah, when the Hujjaj will be on the plain of Arafah, here 
If the believer fasts on the day of Arafah, they receive two years of forgiveness. The year that is to come and the year that has passed. One day, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, which is next Thursday, you fast that one day, you receive two years of forgiveness. And so do not neglect these days. As your heart yearns to make Hajj, do not neglect what you can do here. Create a Hajj for yourself here in Boston. Come together in the house of Allah. Do your takbirat. As we said over the past two weeks, the days of Dhul Hijjah are days of Al Ikthar, Min Al Tahlili, Wat Takbiri, Wat Tahmeed. These are days when you say in abundance, La ilaha illallah, Walhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah, Alhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst the Muwahideen in these days, amongst those who, who truly believe in the oneness of God. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst the mukabbireen in these days. Those who say Allahu Akbar, God is great, God is great. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst the hamideen. Those who send, who, who have praise of Allah jalla wa ala in their hearts. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Faya fawza al-mustaghfirin, astaghfirullah. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا Brothers and sisters, as Brother Yusuf noted before the Hajj, tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, I myself will be embarking upon this sacred pilgrimage. And this is my first time to make Hajj. Allah jalla wa ala has willed it that this is my first time to make Hajj. And so I ask that you being my community to forgive me for my sins and my shortcomings. That if I have wronged anyone or I have neglected anyone's requests or if I have insulted anyone or hurt anyone, please forgive me from your heart so that Allah Jalla wa ala can open up the doors of his bounties and his blessings upon me, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And so inshallah, I promise you that all of you will be in my dua. Every single one of you inshallah my community, this beautiful, blessed community in Boston, all of you, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, will be in my dua, insha'Allah ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us on this day of Jumu'ah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise our ranks, to forgive our sins and to have mercy upon us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all hajjam mabrur. We ask us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a righteous pilgrimage to the sacred house in Mecca. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our hearts to righteousness and goodness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who surrender their wills to Allah. Ya Allah, make us amongst the true Muslimin and the true Mu'mineen, those who surrender their will to you and those who believe in you. Ya Allah, make us a people who fulfill your calls and your commands. Make us a people who respond to your calls when you call upon us. Ya Allah, we ask you to respond to our calls when we call upon you as you have promised. Ud'uni astajib lakum. Ya Allah, we call upon you in these days to guide our hearts, to purify our hearts, to forgive our sins to bless our children, to bless our families, to grant us good health and good wealth. Ya Allah, bless and protect our community. Uplift the conditions of the Muslims and the Mu'mins across the world, Ya Allah. Protect our brothers and sisters in Syria, in Burma, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Arabia, in Africa, and all across the world, Ya Allah. We ask you to protect them and honor them and give, grant them victory in their affairs. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقيم الصلاة